Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us for Sunday worship. I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, it's good to be here. It's a uh, it's a beautiful day, and uh, we can come together as a church virtually and continue to worship Him and to continue to to learn more about His Word. Um, before we begin, let me uh, have a word of prayer and commit this time into God's hands. Uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks so much for, for gathering us here this morning. You brought us all here for a reason. Um, so Lord, may you use this time to, to speak to us so that we can um, listen to your spirit and learn more about you. And so Lord, help us be in tune with your spirit. And as we continue through the study of Exodus, um, let us not forget the many things that you have blessed us with the things that you have done in our past so that we can meet you even today, right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so we're continuing our study through the book of Exodus. And the last time we looked at the perfect deliverance uh, for the Israelites. And as Pharaoh finally lets God's people go and they're starting their journey out of Egypt. We saw that they didn't leave empty um, because God provided them through the Egyptian people. So the Israelites left at the beginning of their journey with gold, with silver, and with clothes. Then God provided more instructions to them about how to celebrate the Passover, and uh, Pastor John talked about that last week. Today we're going to see God give Israel some instructions about the importance of taking time to remember what he, what he did for them. And the other day, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about my childhood, uh, remembering the church that I went to. It was uh, Toronto Vietnamese Alliance Church, and uh, I got some good memories for that church. There was a time in my Sunday school class, my Sunday school teacher uh, taught us about God's word by giving us something sweet to eat uh, because God's word is always sweet and tasty. There was a time when she taught us about God's judgment too by handing out different sized trophies or rewards or medals to all of us. Uh, there was a time when the church had VBS and, um, and we would play hockey in the church basement. I remember it was so much fun every time after VBS we would play like a, a game of hockey with these plastic sticks and kind of shooting each other in, in the net and all those things. It was so much fun. There was a time when my family had our, our picture taken in front of the church. It was sort of like a, a yearbook or a church photo album. That, the, that we would all get. And I remember we would take this picture as a family. Uh, those were good memories too. Also, I had some not so good memories from that, from church. Memories like when I clogged the, the toilet at church, there was this, this washroom hidden behind the church or at the back of the church. And I would do things or fool around a, a lot and clog the, purposely clog the toilet and eventually it ended up flooding the washroom. Uh, there was also a time when I, I broke the church clock in the church office. It was not like those typical normal clocks. It was actually a clock that was our anniversary uh, present from another church. So I learned my lesson a lot in that church and it stuck with me as, as a bad memory. Um, then I remember the pastor was preaching and I was sitting in the pews and I was bored and kind of looking down and pretending that I was like praying. Anyways, taking time to remember things in our lives from the past is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Oftentimes it brings our thoughts uh, back to what God has done in our lives, whether that's good or bad things and how far he has brought us and that's what we see here in Exodus 13 
God is giving instructions uh, for some of the things that will help them remember what he has done for them. So let's look at a couple ways the Israelites were supposed to take time to remember what God did for him. And the first thing that we see here in verses 1 to 2 and later on in verses 11 to 16, it says we see that God remembers, we need to remember God by dedicating it to him. When I was 12 years old, I remember going to my mom to speak to her about something very special, something that was important to me. I remember telling a deep calling into my heart to serve God in ministry. At the time, I wasn't sure if God wanted me to be a pastor or what exactly what he had planned for me. But I knew he wanted me to go into ministry. So I went to my mom and I told her, Mom, I believe God is calling me into ministry. I like to dedicate my life to God and say yes to his calling on my life. I remember how proud my mom and father was. So I dedicated my life to God. And I'll never forget that day. I look back on it and smile. And think, wow, God has been so good to me and brought me to where he wants me to be. I'm so blessed. And on that day, I acknowledged to God that I am his and he could have my life. Here in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, we see that God telling the Israelites to do something similar. He says, consecrate to me every firstborn male the first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belonging to me, whether human or animal. So the firstborn males, whether man or beast or animal, were supposed to be set apart, dedicated, and devoted to God. And there are several reasons why God wanted the Israelites to do this. And the first reason is this. Israel was God's firstborn child. They were his nation. Remember back in Exodus chapter 4 verse 22, God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So it is a reminder to them that they were his firstborn, his people, and as such, they were supposed to live differently. The second thing is the firstborn was viewed as, as the best, and God deserves the best. So the best was always given to God, and you, I, you and I should remember that, that God deserves our very best. Always. Third, we see here is by setting the firstborn apart, it would be a reminder to all generations that God redeemed Israel and spared their firstborn on the night he took all of Egypt's firstborns. Notice what God says at the end of verse 2. He says, belongs to me. And I want us not to miss that belongs to me while in egypt pharaoh looked at the israelites and thought they are mine that's what pharaoh said they are mine and he and his people enslaved the israelites for about 400 years then even as god was sending these plagues pharaoh he didn't want to let them go and you can see how selfish or obsessive pharaoh was he thought they were his but God, he makes it very clear they belong to him. This is something Israel needed to remember. And because it would be awful to say, or even easy for them to forget this, they began to enjoy their, their freedom in God. So if you skip down to verse 4 in Exodus 13, God, he continues telling Israel about the importance of, of setting apart the firstborn and dedicating them once they reach the promised land. And God already knew that the Israelites would rebel 
and would wander the wilderness for 40 years. And later on, we see this until the older generation all died. So he knew that the new generation entering this promised land would not remember what he did for them unless they had a way to remember. So this, this law of the firstborn would be just that. But why are firstborn males animals included here? Why, did, why does it say in scripture that the firstborn male animals are included? But for one thing, their animals benefited from God's protection on Israel during the 10th plague. Just like the people did, their firstborn didn't die in the plague. But even more than that, God is telling them that they needed to be set apart, they needed to be dedicated and sacrifice the firstborn animals because it's their way of showing gratitude for sparing their firstborn. It's interesting too because God is very specific about how to do this. He tells them that every male firstborn shall be the Lord's. Then in verse 13, he explains to them what to do with the firstborn of their donkeys. Donkeys were um, ceremony, they were unclean. So the Israelites couldn't take them to the priest be, uh, to be sacrificed because they were unacceptable uh, to be sacrificed. Instead, God tells them they can sacrifice a lamb in place of the donkey in order to redeem or buy it back for a price. That way, a sacrifice was still involved. And after that, they could use the donkey for whatever they needed to. If for some reason they didn't want to redeem the donkey, they still had to make a sacrifice. So they were required to break its neck, which of course would kill the donkey. And since donkeys were so valuable, most of them were willing to redeem it with a lamb instead of killing it. Then at the end of verse 13, God says, redeem every firstborn among your sons. And obviously, human sacrifices was forbidden among the Jewish people. So it was the same idea with the firstborn male as it was with the donkey. The firstborn male child was to be redeemed. In the book of Numbers, God, he explains that this redemption was to be five shekel apiece. Um, so once again, this was the way for Israel to show their gratitude to God for sparing their firstborn by dedicating them. So the Israel's firstborn male animal was to be slain or killed, representing a substitutionary sacrifice. And the male child was to be redeemed. All of this was a sign it was a symbol, a reminder through rituals of God's power, deliverance of his people. In verses 14 to 16, God, he explains to the Israelites the importance of teaching their children why they do this. You know that when your parents, they tell you all these things, they, they want to pass this down to you and to your children. And as they teach them, they are pointing them to God showing them the importance of being grateful to God and obeying His commands. So what does it mean for us? Are we grateful to God? Are we grateful to God? I think it's important for us to remember that just like God said, they are mine. They belong to God. They belong to Him about their firstborn males and his nation of Israel. He also calls us his children. We belong to him. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, 
that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, we're told He has saved us and He has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time. We are His. We belong to Him. And just like the Israelites dedicated the firstborn to Him, we as Christians should dedicate our lives to Him. He deserves it because of what He's done for us. Sacrificing Himself on the cross, forgiving us for our sins, welcoming us into His family, loving us unconditionally. And if you're wondering what dedicating your life to Him might look like, Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, His pleasing, and His perfect will. Dedicating your life to Him means living your life for Him every single day. So I would ask you a question. Are you dedicated to God no matter what? So that's the first thing that we see here. The second thing we see here is that remembering God, we should be celebrating we see this in verse 3 all the way down to verse 10. When I was a kid, birthday parties were a lot of fun and exciting than they are as an adult. I remember when I turned 7 years old, I was so excited. So I invited a bunch of people and a bunch showed up. One of the things my family one of the things about my family when I was growing up though was that we didn't have that much money. So I told my friends that we're gonna have a blast and my birthday's gonna be awesome. Instead, my mom made frozen pizza in the oven and my mom made a birthday cake for me. And since the party wasn't much fun as my friends thought it would be, anyways, I tell you the story because it meant so much to me that my parents was willing to throw a party for me. It was a time of celebration. I'll never forget my parents telling me how much they love me and how much they are proud of me. Here in verse 3, we, we find Moses telling the Israelites about the importance of remembering the day they left Egypt by ce celebrating each year with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It would be a time for them to look back and remember God's deliverance from the land of slavery and bringing them into the Promised Land. And the Feast of the Unleavened Bread was to be celebrated as a seven-day festival. Imagine having a birthday for seven days, but they, had, they celebrated it for seven days. For a week. It was like a sign that they're on their hands or on their foreheads as a reminder to all generations of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt. Why seven days? Well, remember that number seven in the Bible is God's number of perfection, and the leaven represents sin. So they celebrated with unleavened bread. So the feast was seven days of celebration. And if you look in verse 7, God, he explains the importance of fathers telling their children about the reason for remembering God's deliverance through celebrating this feast. 
So what about us? Should we be taking time to remember and celebrating? And if so, what should we celebrate? And I believe that every day as Christians should be celebrating because of the fact we are forgiven and part of God's family. In Psalm ch chapter 35 verse 9, it says that my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation. In Luke chapter 10 verse 20, Jesus told his disciples to rejoice because their names are written in heaven and that command applies to us as well. Every day is a good day for us because every day is another day to rejoice to be happy and to celebrate remembering all that God has done for us some people might say well aren't the, their holidays set aside to celebrate Christ's birthday and his death and his resurrection yes of course there is there's Easter there's Christmas at Christmas we celebrate his birth the day that he left his place in heaven and was born uh, through the Virgin Mary becoming one of us coming to save the world and then there's Easter. We start by celebrating his death on the cross because of the day that he paid the penalty for our sins. Then we celebrate his resurrection because he defeated death and sin and he made it possible for all of us to be saved from our sin. These holidays are obviously the two times of the year when churches are the fullest. To be honest, I don't know how that will look at this year because of, uh, I guess, the COVID-19, but that's pretty sad because for so many people, their limit, they're celebrating to only two times of year. The rest of the time, thoughts about God is rare. It ever, it, it's pretty rare in their minds. And for those of us who regularly attend church we sometimes fall into this routine and it becomes about checking off a box or even trying to look spiritual and trying to keep tradition so we become like the pharisees you and i as christians shouldn't be like that and you and i as christians should be celebrating jesus every single day we have every reason in this world to, to be, and no reason why we shouldn't. So that's the second thing. The third thing that we need to re be reminded in this passage is that remembering God by obeying and following. And we see this in verse 17 to 22. Sometimes God, he wants us to do things differently than we'll do it and if we're up it's if it, if it were up to us here we we find the israelites on their way out of egypt but instead god sends them the shorter and easier route he sends them on a different and longer route he sends them through a coastal route with the shortest route and the way most people traveled from Egypt to, to Canaan. It was also a trade route so that there would be plenty of food and water for people to purchase along the trade along the way. However, the Egyptian military outposts were there as well. And God knew that the Israelites weren't ready for any kind of fight yet. So he had them go a different way, by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And we know the story. It's interesting because we don't see the Israelites put up any kind of complaint or grudging or, or fussing about it. They simply obey God and they just say, okay, let's do it. It might not have made sense to them, but they already saw God at work at this point, delivering them from uh, 10 plagues. It was still fresh in their minds. So at least at this point, they were willing to follow God, even if they didn't seem like the better path. 
Not only that they were obedient in this area, but we also see them being obedient to God by keeping their promise about their ancestors made by Joseph. He wanted his bones to be buried in the promised land, so they took his bones with him. Then instead of trying to find their way around their, uh, their own, they followed God who graciously guided them through the pillar of clouds by day and pillar of fire by night. It's absolutely awesome when we see examples of such this where God takes care of his people in every area of their lives. As they followed the cloud and looked up to it, it would be a constant assurance to them that God was with them and would lean on them to, to the promised land, just like he said he would. In Psalm 105, verse 39, we read that God spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give them light in the night. So the cloud was a sun and a shield for his people. They couldn't go wrong or get lost if they followed the cloud. And so it's so easy. Sometimes we wish that for our life that was something was really off, uh, obvious for us in our walk with God, even for something obvious for us as a church. In Psalm, Psalm 84, verse 11, uh, it says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestowed favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk is blameless. The Israelites, so the Israelites could faithfully follow God's presence in the cloud, knowing it was proof of God's presence and protection of his people. What about us this morning? The wonderful thing about being a Christian is that when you give our lives to Jesus, when we give our lives to Jesus, the Holy Spirit enters our heart. So his presence is with us always. Since his presence is with us, he guides us. If we truly love him, we will follow his guidance and obey his, his promptings. And of course, in order for us to do this, we must be reading and understanding his word, praying and spending time with him because that's where he instructs us what to do. And that's where we hear him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive of every single thought to make it obedient to Christ. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands. In 2 John verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6 says, And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his commands is that you walk in love. These are just a few verses that address the importance of obedience in the life of a Christian following Jesus Christ. And the reason that for that obedience is because we love him. However, if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit and following his prompting, his guidance, and you have no desire to, then you're, you're going on a dangerous path. In Titus chapter 1, verse 16 says, They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So brothers and sisters, we must be obedient followers of Christ. No, we're not perfect, but our heart desire and our effort should be done with our eyes on Christ. Remember God by following and obeying him. So we looked at remembering God by dedicating 
remembering God by celebrating and remembering God by being obedient and following Him. And in order to be truly dedicated to, to God, in order to, to celebrate Him, and in order to obey and follow Him, we must first be one of His followers. And Scripture tells us that we, we have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so that means that all of us deserve hell. And yet, yet God, he, he loves us so much that He gave His only one Son, Jesus on the cross, the perfect, sinless God, man, beaten, bleeding, hanging from the cross, dying for his sins. Then he rose again on the third day in the heaven today on his throne. So now whoever believes in him truly, genuinely will not perish for eternity in the lake of fire, but will have this eternal life with Jesus in heaven. If you're here today, this morning, or even watching, and you've never given your life to Jesus, I encourage you to do so today, today, right now. He loves you. He loves you so much. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks so much for bringing us here to, to speak and to, to, to learn of your words, Lord, for you to speak to us. And so, God, may you help us be reminded, just like you reminded the Israelites, how you brought them out of Egypt. And I know for us, we, we look at our lives and we see all these things at this present moment as we as our Christian walk with you, it seems maybe kind of dry or maybe we're drifting away, but looking in our past, that we can see how you brought us to this point. You have been with us ever since the beginning. And so Lord, let us continue to strive to look towards you, just like the Israelites looked at the clouds, the pillar of clouds, the sun, as you shield them, as you guide them, Lord, may you be that for us. May you lead us as a church in our lives so that we can continue to glorify you. So Lord, I thank you so much for, for just for your son, Jesus Christ. And for those of us who are listening here this morning um, and have yet to accept you, into their hearts, the, this gift of salvation. I just pray a prayer for, for, our, for, for them, Lord, that you would just tug in their hearts so that they would see you clearly, that you came to save them, to love us unconditionally despite the sins that we have committed. And Lord, may our sins be cleansed by the blood of you, of the Lamb. We praise in Jesus' name.